what were the biggest lessons you learned uh, from Tim? Uh, from Tim. Oh, so um, Tim was one of the most uh, influential and important people in my life because he he showed me what's possible. He gave me the room and the space and the opportunities to show me what I was capable of and that I could play with people like him. You know, I, I, I thought I knew it and then I got to experience it. And so it's kind of a selfish answer in that regard, you know, of like, it gave me the opportunity to show myself what I was capable of and he allowed me to play on that field. Hey, I'm Jeremy, and this is my podcast, Backstage Careers, where I interview the men and women who are working behind the scenes with some of the biggest entrepreneurs and creators out there. In today's episode, I talked to Charlie Hohen, who's worked with a couple of influential people, including Ramit Sethi, Tucker Max, but most notably, he's worked with Tim Ferriss. He, was, he started as his assistant and then slowly built up to being his director of special projects back in the days where Tim was launching the four hour body. So he was pretty involved with that launch. Uh, it was a very special episode for me since Charlie is the guy who inspired me initially to embark on this journey of apprenticing for my mentors. And he wrote this book called recession proof graduate in which he documents how he landed a job with the people he's worked with. I read that book when I was a freshman in college and that inspired me to go work for Tom Bailey and most recently Noah Kagan. So I'm really excited for you guys to hear his full story. As always, feel free to DM me on Instagram or Twitter. My handle is at Jeremy John Mary. And let's dive into the episode. All right. Charlie, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jeremy. Excited to be here. Yeah, excited to share your story. So um, before getting into the nitty gritty details of uh, how you ended up working with Tim Ferriss, Ramit Sethi, uh, Tucker Max, uh, can you give us a little context of where you were when you graduated college? What was the economic context and what led you to start reaching out to uh, uh, people uh, you look up to that, that you looked up to that you wanted to work with? Absolutely. So it was 2008, so not quite as bad as 2020, uh, certainly, but it was the recession hit. And so when I got out of school, no one was really hiring. And, you know, the internship that I'd done at this ad agency that had looked promising as a first job, all of a sudden they laid off a bunch of their staff. And so the advocates I had there were gone. And even if they were there, I wouldn't have gotten the job. And so I spent the next couple of months applying to over a hundred jobs and they didn't have one click applications, right? So it, it was a lot of filling up forms and going through the, you know, modifying your resume each time. And I remember I hit a point where I was like, I know I'm in triple digits and I was getting, you know, newspaper clippings from my parents on the stairs, you know, when I was living at my parents' house and of, of like, you should apply to this job. And I'd applied to over a hundred and only two had gotten back to me and asked for an interview. Uh, one of them was a staging company, like a you move giant audio and video equipment for bands. And I actually did that uh, for for like uh, one or two gigs, and it was uh, not the best, healthiest culture. <laughs> uh, it's basically like a moving job, right? A moving job. Like like yeah. Manual labor. Yeah. Correct. And so the people there were not super nice uh, or cohesive at all. And then the other one was a pyramid scheme that I just like did some research on right before I went into the interview. And it was like all one star warnings online. And it was like, do not <laughs> touch this company. <laughs> and so I hit a point where I remember saying to, I remember actually laying on my bathroom floor one night and just thinking, gosh, all the advice on 
career stuff was a lie. Like, it doesn't work. I mean, I spent four hours in a resume uh, optimization class and, like, really learning the ins and outs of this stuff. And it's like, man, none of this works. It doesn't – it either worked in the past and doesn't work today or it's just, like, it's the blind leading the blind. Yeah, it's yeah. – it's, because I'm competing against hundreds of other people who look just like me, who are totally green, have no experience that's meaningful in any way. I'm competing against people in their 30s who have a decade of experience. I don't have a shot, truly. And so, like, I, I remember thinking laying on my bathroom floor, I have to do something totally different. It's this isn't going to work. And at the time, I had also started doing a virtual internship uh, with Seth Godin, the you know godfather of digital marketing, basically. Uh -huh. And when he opened this up, uh, thousands of people applied to the point where he was like, I'm going to make it virtual so anybody who wants to come can come. I think over 500 people it showed up on the first couple of meetings and then it's it started to drop and so i was like if i just stick with this through the summer and kind of do it a few hours a week this will be at least something interesting to talk about on my resume to business people and also i'll probably want to be one of the few who's left and sure enough it was like a dozen people made it through the internship and he recommended us on his blog but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So um, I told my parents, I'm just going to try to do things that are interesting. And I'm going to reach out to people I want to work with and offer to work for free just so I can get going and do something. And if that, if nothing pans out by, I think it was like, do, over the next 90 days if, if it doesn't turn into paid work i told my dad i'll become a, a landman in the oil and gas industry because he was in the oil and gas <laughs> industry and like that job terrified me but i knew it paid well we make money. right out yeah. the, right out the gate so i was like you know we'll we'll all win regardless of <laughs> the circumstances at the end of this 90 day trial so what happened was was fascinating to me um as soon as i started applying a, kind of this ideology of doing not just free work but being proactive about it basically i pretended that i had dream clients and dream gigs and i would assign myself work so for instance the i would uh, the first one was really uh ramit sethi the author of I Will Teach You to Be Rich, he, he, had a per, he had a popular personal finance blog back then. And I looked at the blog and on his site and I saw that he did some speaking, but he didn't have a demo reel. And that he was also really good on video. And so I reached out to him and said, hey, I'm a huge fan of your stuff. I love what you're doing. And in fact, it's actually improved my finances in this, this, and this way. Um, I noticed that you uh, are, you know, actually really good on video, but you never do it because video is very cumbersome and it's a lot of work. Why don't I do your video stuff for you? And why don't you just record it and send it to me and I'll turn it into something good. I'll, I'll run your YouTube so you don't have to think about it. By the way, here's a video that I've already done, you know, and I showed him my work and, you know, because I was I was a self-taught kind of hobbyist videographer and uh, but I was I was pretty good. And he wrote back super enthusiastically. We got on the phone. Uh, turned out he had interned with Seth Godin as well. And so we had a connection there. And uh, in any case, we ended up doing some work together. Same thing happened with Tucker Max, who's now one of my close friends. Like uh, we, I reached out to him with an offer of free work. We started doing some marketing stuff together. Uh, he invited me onto his movie tour and we went around the country and I got paid for that. And then 
both of those guys recommended me to Tim. And for anybody who wants to see the exact email I sent, the very first email I sent to Tim, uh, look up the, um, I think it's like the, tw the 12 lessons learned while marketing the four hour body. It's some post like that. And the, the beginning of the post is like how we met, how we officially uh, connected over email. And the reality was Ramit and Tucker and somebody else actually all recommended me as a person to work with at, at relatively the same time, independent of each other. And that was like my goal. I was like, man, if I could work with Tim Ferriss, because he'd just come out with the four hour work week, you know, like yeah. the year before. I was like, this dude is a genius. I know I could like do stuff with him that we would we would blow up. I understand this audience really well. I am his audience. And so but I knew he was going to be exceptionally difficult to go at straight forward, you know, um, yeah. because I was still pretty inexperienced. And so once I I garnered enough remarkable experience and had some results, I'd helped with Ramit in his book launch. We got that to number one on Amazon overall. Like we beat the Twilight series. And so like I was kind of in charge with, uh, you know, doing the live stream that day back then when Ustream was a thing. I finally had some interesting results to talk about. They recommended me to Tim. We started, I started doing a little bit of free work for him. He started paying me and then I ended up uh, being hired as his first full-time employee. And we ended up working together for three years and we still keep in touch and occasionally come together to do something, right? So all to say, and, and same with Ramit, like a few months ago, I helped him set up his video studio, his video podcast studio in his house. So all to say, like it was totally transformative and it was so ridiculously effective compared to the outdated, ineffective advice that most career counselors are going to hand you, right? And so, and it was better than an internship because it was like, I'm creating the role. I'm not just being told, hey, go get coffee, kid, and you'll earn your way through the ranks someday. It was like, no, I'm, I'm assigning myself valuable work. And then I'm coming to them and saying, hey, can you give me the green light? Or I've already done it. And because of that, all of them wanted to work with me and wanted to continue working with me. And you are a shining example, Jeremy, of this same strategy working exceptionally well, regardless of how bad the economy is, right? It's like yeah. you have the green light to create value at any time, any time. Like I, I am not afraid of being unemployed or like, how am I ever going to get a job? You know, making a certain amount of money, that's maybe a different story, right? But like to to secure opportunities to create opportunities for yourself is always accessible and um so that's you know i wrote that book in 2009 so that was 13 years ago recession proof graduate i've had so many people reach out saying they implemented this strategy and it worked for them and i can share some of those stories if you want but i've been talking long enough so i'll pause there 100 percent. i mean first of all Thanks for writing that book because, I mean, that, like you mentioned, my path, like, that's what inspired me back in. I, I don't know when, at what point I read it. I was, I think, uh, toward the end of high school or beginning of college, and I read that, and I was like, holy shit, like, I had no, like, I had no concept that this was, like, possible, right? Then read your book, and I think it was two other people. I think Taylor Pearson. I'm not sure if you're mm -hmm. familiar. The End of Jobs. Yeah. yeah, The End of Jobs, and then... Ryan Holiday um, of kind of spoke about his his apprenticeship with Robert Greene and stuff and like those three pieces coming together I was like well like like this is what I want to do so big thank you and I'll, I'll put a link uh, in the description I recommend anyone that wants like a, a job like working with someone they look up to to read that book and I actually want you I, I want to break down you have six steps in that book I want to break them down and then kind of reverse like go back and like look at your 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 path and kind of like how uh, those steps apply to to like your path. So totally, yeah. So I've I've slightly updated those by the way to make them a little bit easier to kind of follow and and implement at a high level. But yeah, let's do it. Okay. 
Do you mean in your? Because I know you now it's on. It's available on Amazon as well. Uh, it used to be an ebook. Now now you have it. Is that the updated version or? So, what I ended up doing, Jeremy, was I ended up teaching it in workshops and group coaching settings and one on one, and oh. so I took, you know, the teachings from the book and made it a little bit more uh, comprehensive or or like I, sh- I shouldn't say comprehensive, it's thorough of mm-hmm. what precisely you need to do. So the the six steps is an acronym, it's stages. Uh, okay. So showcase, target, audit, gift, execute, sell. And so um, do you want me to kind of walk through each one? Please. Okay. Yeah, so, go for it. So the first step I think is, is you have to have a showcase of some sort. And this is the modern resume. The reason resumes don't work is because they're text, you know, writing has only really existed for how many thousands of years versus like eyesight and, uh, experiencing a sensory, you know, experiencing a human visually TikTok. <laughs> right right yeah. the reason TikTok yeah. took off so um showcase it can be the tool doesn't matter as much right so back in the day i used to recommend like wordpress or strikingly but now it can be TikTok. but you need to have something that captures your essence and your abilities and skills like you can't just list i know final cut it's like that means literally nothing to me. Yeah. You have show, no tell. idea yeah. what you mean by that. Show me, show me, show me. Don't tell. That's the fundamental flaw in resumes. They all look the same and they just tell. They don't actually show. Show. So that's on a high level, that's what a showcase is. Okay. Target is uh is is more of a research process. So you're finding opportunities in people or companies that are aligned with your values, both on a personal level and a professional level. In other words, are they a culture fit for you and the type of person that not only who you are, but who you want to grow into? Is this a person or a team of people that you can see yourself grabbing beers with, that you could see yourself going on a road trip with? Uh, Is this also a team that is like, are are they, You know, depending on your risk tolerance, you might be gravitating to startups or you might want to say, like, is money not a thing to them? Or do they have millions of customers? Do do they have a budget? uh, Are they an annual uh, or I'm sorry, are they a public publicly traded company that has annual reports that are accessible to me that I can see where they are as a company? Right. It's it totally depends on your personal and professional values. For me, it was like, I want to work with entrepreneurs. I want to work with people who uh, are self-starters, who are really good at putting ideas out into the world and having them cascade through the population and make a positive impact and a positive change on those people and help them in their lives, right? And so that's why I gravitated to the people I did is like they're highly effective communicators and storytellers that are able to give actionable recipes that improve people's lives. And so that was that was my personal thing. Audit is, uh, it's not like a tax term, but it's, it's a thorough examination of everything that you can find on online or in any other form of media about them and writing down from a almost like a doctor's perspective right a doctor who's examining somebody's body who they come in and they're like hey doc i got something wrong with me you're looking for hey are there symptoms of things that could possibly be wrong here or things that could be improved and like anybody can do this anybody uh, you know a grad a, a college graduate looking at spacex's website can do this you know it's not and I think uh, what I've come across in this part of the process, this is where some people can get really hung up is there, who am I? I'm, I feel like an imposter to, to tell these people like who are doing so well that they're, they're doing something wrong. And, you know, like I'm, I'm not that person. And I've also seen people butcher this part of the process because 
they'll be like, oh, this person's website design is terrible. So I'm going to email them and tell them it's terrible and then give them <laughs> a crude mock-up in Canva yeah. of how they can improve it when I'm not a designer. Like that is the worst thing you can do, right? Yeah. And so they, you're, you're not you're not reaching out to them with these problems yet. You're more just brainstorming. You're being open to, hey, if I was to advise them, if I was their peer, if I was their partner, if I was right alongside there with them, equal status, and I was looking at here, what are the opportunities here for growth in your business? What are the opportunities to cut costs or make your customers' lives more delightful or less stressful? What are some ways that I could possibly do I see anything that's potentially costing them a lot of time and money and energy? Okay, these are all areas where I can add value potentially. And you write down everything, right? Like, I'm not a web designer, but I would still write down that, even though I might not have an idea to fix it, right? So, um, so that's, that's the audit phase. And the next part of the phase is, is really where, like, things get super fun and uh, where you can really shine, which is the gift phase. So there's two, two parts to this phase. It's like you, you make the gift and then you give the gift. Now, there's a lot of caveats with making the gift. Number one is like you, you don't want to spend the next uh, month of your life making a gift like you can get in perfection mode and then spend weeks creating something that like uh gets totally lost in the shuffle or they're like terrible time to email me this let me get back to you in three months or whatever so you want you you want to put a, a constraint on the amount of time that you spend on making this gift but this is where the research that you did in the audit phase comes in handy so you've looked at their problems right and now you kind of just circle the ones in the audit that you're like, okay, I'm, I'm fairly confident I could provide something here, right? I'm fairly confident I could come to them with something of value here. Um, and then you put it together. You put it together in a way that they can consume quickly and easily and that they'll be like immediately wowed or they, they, the best is when you can, they can either actually implement it or you come to them having already gotten the result. So I'll, I'll tell you the different levels of gifts you can do to kind of give uh, some examples. Um, on the most basic level, the most basic that anybody can apply, um, which I don't necessarily recommend, I'd recommend a combo of this, but the, the most basic level is free work. To say, hey, I love your work, I know you're super busy, um, and I bet this part of your process takes you a long time. Why don't you hand it off to me? Uh, I'll do it for free. And all I ask is if, you know, after these first two weeks or month or whatever, that we talk about doing more work together that uh, could help you grow your business. Sweet. I have seen that work for a lot of people. I think it's, I think it's really basic uh, because, and it's not bad. It's just like, you're you're simply offering to take a, a low level task off their hands uh and so they may not value it that much and they may not see your potential right they may not see where else they could apply you so that's generally the most basic thing i recommend but like i would prefer you combine it with something else the second level is creativity and so you you give them a gift that that ex it showcases your creativity so one of my favorite examples, do you know uh, Michael Lim, McCall? Yeah. 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 So he landed a job with Mr. Beast. I, I guided him through this process and he created a video, a music video, basically applying to work with Mr. Beast. And it stood out. It was great. It got a lot of attention. Mr. Beast loved it and hired him. And now he runs a, a YouTube channel on behalf of Mr. Beast. And like, he went from being a consultant, right? Who like hated his job to working with the, one of the biggest YouTubers in the world and running his channel. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll link that in the, in the show notes as well. It's like a very, it's very impressive the way he executed on that. He's a good friend as well, but, uh, it's very cool. Yeah. It's a great story. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like, that's a great example of like getting creative, right? Um, there, there are a few other levels like 
The next one is uh, being like a problem solver. And so you find problems and then you literally solve them, right? Jack Dorsey got this and when he was a teenager, he did this strategy. He found uh, some errors in code on a website that he was following. It was like a dispatcher's website. And he said, hey, I noticed you had some holes in your code. I wrote the fix, here it is. By the way, I'm Jack and uh, he ended up getting a job with them nice. by doing that. And so like you can do that uh, here and there. Another example is like you make them a gift that if you're not a coder, you don't have a hard skill set like that, right? You might compile together a list of uh, or, or like a document of research that matters to them, right? And so there's a brilliant uh, website called Nina for Airbnb. And it was this woman named Nina who uh, she wanted to, to apply to Airbnb and she made a website showcasing who she was as a person, but listing out like, here are uh, challenges that I see uh, Airbnb having. Here are areas of, of room for opportunity. Here's how I would come in and solve them. And she got, she got responses from the founders of Airbnb. She got over 200 job offer or like interview offers from companies like Google, like that she didn't even apply to because this application went viral and it's like think of it, think about that for a second man like do you want to apply to 200 jobs blasting out your bullshit resume and you know bs cover letters or do you want to spend a ton of time on one, on your dream job or your dream opportunity yeah. and really go for it like sincerely really put yourself out there and go for it because if you do it's very likely the world, the world is going to reward you in some way. And the interesting thing about that was she would, she would, she didn't get the job with Airbnb, Actually, but yeah, she, so. yeah, to, for whatever reason, but she would reach out to other companies and be like, Hey, I'm the person who did this campaign. Mm. Do you want a conversation? It was now like a portfolio element kind of. Exactly. Like, part of exactly. The so yeah. She was able to leverage that. And so there's there's a problem solving element. I did this. This is what stood out with Tim when he decided, like, I want to work with this guy. I was reading through the comments on one of his blog posts and I was like, hey, I noticed a bunch of people said they wanted the audio for whatever you had posted. And I, so I went together. I went ahead, posted the audio to a site where it could be locally hosted. I gave them the embed code to embed in a player. I, you know, took a screenshot. I was like, embed it here on the post and like, that'll be good. And he loved that. Cause it's like, and I've heard from many people who are like, I just kept solving problems for people I wanted to work with until they hired me. And it's like, yeah, that works. Yep. And then the final level of gift giving, I think, um, so do you know Ryan Graves? No, haven't heard the name. He was the, he was the former CEO of Uber. Okay. And he, t he told me the story uh, where he wanted to work for Foursquare. And, but he was like in, I don't know, Wisconsin or Chicago or something. And he, he was like all excited about Silicon Valley, you know? So he went door to door or business to business and set up Foursquare accounts for 20 of them. And he onboarded them, showed them how to use it and everything. And then he asked them all to email the CEO of Foursquare on the same day and say, and thank, thank them for Foursquare and say, hey, Ryan Graves set us up. And uh, he got a job there, shockingly. <laughs> and That's so awesome. um, like if you, if you are able to act effectively as a salesperson who grows the company without damaging that person's brand, you're in. And like, I know another guy who got a job with uh, this author, he, he became such a fan of his book, he went out and closed PayPal as a client for him. And like, without even, you know, asking for anything. And the guy has him on as his full time, like partner now, you know, and so it's like, there is nothing stopping you from creating this value. Right? I, I love what you said before, um, about pretend like you already have a job with them, even though like they have no, like the person has no clue you're working for them, but like, just like pretend and like, 
like who cares like it doesn't you don't need a job to to add the value right just like like if you're just graduating college right you have no prospects of a job like like pick someone and pretend you already work for them and like see what 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 turns out of it like comes out of it yeah right? yeah and again going back to that uh offering free work you know i, I kind of diminished that at the beginning dude that's how warren buffett got his start you know, mm -hmm. that's how he was able to work with Benjamin Graham. Yeah. And he makes the joke that he's like, I offered to work with for him for free. He said I was overpriced, which is a <laughs> great, great joke because yeah. it's like you are actually overpriced because it's costing him a lot to train you and get you up to a level of proficiency yeah. to legitimize working with such an expert. Right. But I've got a million stories like that. I think my favorite one is Boss Ording, who got hired by Steve Jobs. He came into Apple and the interview went terribly. Like he, he, he walked out dejected being like, I just totally blew that. He happens to see Steve Jobs in the hallway. And he's like, Steve, I just wanted to show you something. He opens up his laptop and he's like, I made this for because I think you should do this for Apple. And it was the magnifying glass, the applications. When you put your mouse over the applications, it makes it oh, wow. magnified, right? That effect was created by him. That was his application. Steve Jobs said, my God, and hired him on the spot. Wow. And so it's like, that's that's the importance of like showing, yep. showing, you know, it's like yeah. you, there's nothing stopping you from coming in and like you will blow every applicant out of the water I've talked to multiple HR experts and they're like, no one does this strategy and the people who do always get the job. And so, um, and so I, I linger on gift because it's such an important one, but uh, the gift giving part of the process is, is where you really have to finesse it, right? This is where like you, you have to expect there is a chance they may not see this, it'll slip through the cracks, they're very busy, they're in the middle of funding, whatever. Um, but the way that I always advocate, if you can, if you're personable on video and you look, you know, professional and you're, you're smiling and you're, you know, you can communicate your body language well, send them a one minute video. Say, I just wanted to send you this message and say how much I love what you're doing. Here's how it affected me right there you've built you've established some report like they trust you and they want to hear the rest of the message i wanted to say uh i noticed that you might need some help with fill in the blank well i actually took some time and put together this report or whatever you know i put together this thing that i think may be of use to you i'd love for you to check it out and if it's of interest i have some more ideas on how we could work together and grow your business together and so it, it, take a look if it's of interest uh my my calendar you can set up a call with me at my calendar link below either way just wanted to tell you how much i appreciate you out 60 seconds tops right like uh -huh. And uh, no one, eight, no one receives video messages yet. I, I think there will come a day where there's video email, but it's not here. So it stands out. It's very personable. Um, you you make it easy for them to contact you, and you give them a ton of value. Like you will stand out. I I've gotten emails that are two pages long, and every word is about is about me helping me growing my business, yeah. stories about how I've helped them. I read every single word. If I get an email that's a paragraph long, that's just irrelevant, that I don't care about, that it's all about them, 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 it's like, yeah, that's gonna get ignored. And that's the problem with job applications is all about them, 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 nothing about the person they're trying to connect with. Yeah, I actually did exactly this, the video component where I, cr I created a website um, back, this was when I was trying to work with Tom Bilyeu at Impact Theory, I created a website. I, I want to work for impacttheory.com. And I did exactly that. Like the, 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 the homepage was just like the video, one minute, like you said, just like pitching uh, Tom and like the entire team on uh, how, how the contact had impacted me. And then uh, what I saw, like where my skills were and like what I thought I could help them with. And then like there's a couple of different pages on that page was like demonstrating like here are social media assets I put together for you guys 
Uh, here are like some lead magnets I think you guys could include like on your YouTube videos and stuff. And that's ultimately what, what got me the job. So it, it, it works. <laughs> yeah, man. And, and like, as long as it's not totally gimmicky, yeah. you know, um, it can work really well. We had somebody apply to uh, Scribe, you know, Scribe helps people write, publish, and market books. They applied and said, I used your process to write a book. And it was like everything about everything else on their resume signaled, like not a fit, not a fit. And, uh, but our CEO was like, we have to talk to them. Like they, they used our process to do their own book. Like we, and, and he told us, he was like, I so wanted to hire this person, but like, they just weren't a fit at all. And it just like, it wasn't going to work and I could see it, but like, I was trying to find ways to hire them because it's like, you're demonstrating something. You're demonstrating that you can provide value, that you can be a self-starter and like everyone wants to work with those people. Nice. So that's the gift. Uh, then what's the next step? The E. Execute. Execute, Execute is, is like, I, I realized this was an important part of the process because for a lot of college kids, uh, the way you operate in college is very different from how you need to operate with people in the working world. And you have to have certain levels of professionalism, systems, uh, deadline abilities, you know, like hitting deadlines, uh, level of quality, you know, how you communicate through email, like all these things don't get taught in college or they're not really, uh, you don't you don't understand how to communicate and operate with a busy successful person um so execute really it boils down to do the, during this trial period of working together which is like what you propose during the gift giving process right is like hey i i suggest a trial phase of us working together see if we like working with each other see if we do great things together if not you walk away i walk away no hard feelings whatsoever, um, carry on, right? During the execute phase, you've, you've secured that trial period. And so during the execute phase, you basically uh, wow them. You execute, you get everything done, and you're continually coming to them with another round of ideas, right? Once, once you've completed what you've wanted, because they're not going to come up with those things for you usually sometimes they will and so, but like you're getting to know them during that process you're basically getting over the liver basically i would like people like to say you uh under deliver or over deliver i i think it's just like deliver what you say you're gonna do uh and and do it on time and like get them results uh -huh. right like over delivering, I think people can get caught up in like, oh, it's got to be 10 times better or like it's got to really be super polished. And it's like you got you just got to get results, like good results and do excellent work. Um, and so execute is just about getting things done, getting results. And uh, like an example of this is, you know, my very first paid assignment with Tim was to set up uh this this movie theater event he was hosting and at the time i had a terrible i had terrible cell phone reception and i was so nervous that like i i was just like yeah yeah i heard everything i got everything but like i'd miss like every third word so i didn't i missed like these critical details and i sent him you know here's here it is finished and he called me and he was like respectfully what the hell is this <laughs> and uh, i was like oh man i'm so sorry and um and i hustled to to still get it done on time and do it right and like everything and it's like that's that's what i mean you know it's it's like do the thing that they expect you to do do it well and get get the result and so that you can continue working together because if like I had a great example today. I was supposed to interview this guy. Uh, he didn't even show up to the interview. He didn't respond to texts or emails to be, and he's like amazing at what he does. He was number one on our list. And so it's like, be, be the person you said you were going to be. Yeah. hundred percent. Okay, cool. I like that. And then, uh, the last one S 
Cell. Cell is, you know, it's transitioning into a paid work arrangement of some sort. And uh, all of these situations are handled differently. Like I remember specifically with uh, Michael in helping him with Mr. Beast was he he was like, I don't really know how to negotiate this. Like, I don't know what my value is. I don't know what he's willing to pay. And so I just kind of guided him through, like, here's how to have a conversation with somebody and like to practice it. Right. And sell, you know, at the end of the day, it's just you're you're moving into a mutually harmonious paid arrangement that both of you feel really good about. That's going to allow you to continue to do great work together. And I think the biggest the the hurdle here for a lot of college students is going to be or, or graduates is like threading the line uh, between having having appropriate boundaries for yourself and like what you need to uh, provide for for yourself and you know your future with this person while also understanding like either limitations they might have or you know like I think the biggest thing is be open to options I would much rather you say and this is probably the most important takeaway on this one don't make it a yes or no make it an a b or c right and so you give them options you present uh here's good better best i want to do the best right actually like personally when i'm working with clients i always want to do option b better right like that's the one i'm aiming for if they choose best i'm going to make a ton of money and it's going to be a decent size commitment for me better is like what i what i know i can handle and it's going to pay well good option a is always like this is requiring almost nothing from me but it's it's uh you know valuable for them and it's uh enough enough finances for me to like actually be committed to it so you're saying uh, it's different packages of like um it's almost like on the on the uh let's say a software like SaaS website where it's like yeah it's like 15 dollars for like like two hours of like transcription or something like that $25 for four hours of transcriptions and so on. So like you're doing that with your, your offering of like, Hey, like I can like say it's social media. Hey, I can do like two social media posts like a week at this price. It's like, right. You're basically right. doing and a custom package of like, like how many hours you're going to spend and like what the, the, the thing I'm, I'm a hard no on hourly unless you absolutely have to, because yeah. the amount of hours, does not correlate with the quality of the work or the result I have found. And it often puts you in a combative or, or at least skeptical position with the person that you're working with. 100%. Right. And so like, I'll give you a perfect example. I have uh, a videographer that I work with who's an Emmy award winning videographer and he's, he's amazing at what he does, but he counts his hours. He wants to be paid by the hour. And every time he sends me an invoice, I'm like, why are you going so slow? That shouldn't be my thought. That should not be my first thought. It should be sweet. You've done great work, right? So I generally do not advocate unless you absolutely have to for some reason. I generally don't advocate doing hours. I would I would much rather see a college student say or or somebody new, somebody green in their career say I'll charge you $1000 for for this uh, for this many social media posts or whatever. I'll charge you $2500 for this many and I'll charge you 5000 for this many. And maybe it's a monthly arrangement or a contract and it's like you know, you, you, you're doing $1,000 a month or, or $500 a month, whatever is comfortable for you and you know is going to be good. The other thing to take into consideration here is like, if you're pricing yourself in a way that they're like, that's too low, you know, it can be a counter signal where they're like, do I want to work with this person who's like, you know, I'm asking them to do a commercial and a video production and they're, they're, proposal is eight thousand dollars like you know it's it's like to to a company that is doing a billion dollars in revenue they're going to be like no we want to spend a hundred thousand dollars and feel confident that this thing is going to be good 
right? And so most people at the start of their career do not have any, any sort of idea around like what they can, you, you know, what companies actually want to pay or are willing to pay or like, you know, what signals value and stuff. And it's like, you can't pull those numbers out of nowhere. You, you have to do some research and figure out like what, what, what are you confident about? What do you feel good about? And what are they going to feel good about? And then, you know, it, then it gets into this whole separate discussion of like negotiation. And I have my own personal thoughts on this and I know others do too. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's the gist of it. Interesting. Yeah. I've never actually heard of the, the package approach. Uh, it's very interesting. Kind of like, instead of just like, what's your salary? You know, it's like, Hey, like you're coming almost as a business, right? Like you're coming and you're like offering like, Hey, here are the different tiers of like what, like how involved we, we can be, um, mm -hmm. which I love. Um, okay. So we've got the stages, uh, so I love the acronym. Um, so going back to, uh, your story, so I want to start with so Tucker Max. Um, I, I think you had like a you, you kind of went on his um, on his movie tour. How did you get that job? Like, what was your outreach like? What was your what was your gift, or if there was one at the time? Um, like, how how did you yeah how did you get the gig? So with Tucker, it was really um, crazy because I reached out to him and was like, hey, uh, I saw. You know, I had confidence after doing stuff with Ramit and Seth, and I, so I was like, I got a little wind wind behind my back now, and so I was like, Hey, I uh, I see you're doing a movie, and uh, if you you know if you ever need marketing help, uh, it, my outreach was frankly not that great. What helped me was, uh, and I offered to do video or marketing for him mm -hmm. to help with promoting his movie. He was like, he reached back out and he was like, Hey, um, it took me a second to recognize your, uh, the guy from Hone's musings, which was the name of my blog at the time. And he was like one of 20 subscribers that I had on my blog. Really? And he was like the all seeing eye of the internet, you know, uh, <laughs> and, and he like followed, I think a bunch of the Seth Godin interns, but in any case, he, he was familiar. And, and so it goes back to the power of the showcase, right? It's like if you have something interesting to show that, you know, you're more than just a single piece of paper, or your resume, it opens doors. Like, and to that point, I don't say this braggingly. I say this as like proof of my, my concepts. When I was in my early mid-20s, uh, the CEO of Walt Disney reached out and asked for help with his book. And I was like, this is insane. A Fortune 5 company CEO is coming to a kid effectively with no real business experience <laughs> that really, but it was because I had that blog. It was because I had proof, a showcase that I was the guy who could solve a problem that he had. And so if you're on your showcase, you might not know what you want to put on there, like put on lessons learned, put on things you're, you know, things you're reading, uh, put on there um, your analysis of companies that you love or, or individuals that are doing interesting work, whatever, just like show, show your thought process and your ability. So uh, in any case, with Tucker, um, he was like, yeah, we could definitely do something together. We hopped on the phone um, and chatted. And then uh, I, I did some marketing work for him for a few months, just kind of compiling a database of uh, websites and blogs to reach out to. And then he flew me out to L.A. and kind of broke down. He was He was doing a movie screening. And so I helped a little bit with, with that screening, just a, you know, a little bit, but he mostly flew me out to like meet and see what my interest was ongoing. And, uh, you know, I expressed to him like, I love doing video. And so when it came to the movie tour, he invited me as videographer number two to film 
funny videos and edit funny videos at every stop on this 31 city tour. And I did. And I uh, got paid basically to do a dream gig, which was like just have fun touring the country, making silly videos, trying to make people laugh while promoting this movie. And uh, it was so much fun. And uh, yeah, I mean, on that tour bus, like we really got to know each other and, and really enjoyed each other and uh, each other's friendship. And, and so like, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. That's awesome. And it seemed, I mean, it seems like that, that relationship uh, definitely lasted, right? Like you, you've been working for his, his new company now not new anymore, but like his most recent company, uh, Scribe, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was quite literally his roommate when he and Zach came up with that. Like, oh, really? I, yeah, he had invited me to come visit him in Austin when he moved down there. I loved Austin and I was just like, he had this huge place and in two extra bedrooms. So I started crashing in one and before we knew it, like it'd been like a year and then I decided to get my own apartment. Um, but like, I remember him coming up with that with Zach and also I was helping him with his business too. You know, he, he had written a book called mate and was doing a podcast called mating grounds. Uh -huh. He interviewed me a couple times for that. And then we came up with this concept called helping Joe, uh, which was just like helping a real normal guy named Joe. Uh, with his dating life and then his career and uh, that show blew up that I think it got 10 million listens or something uh, which is a lot for a podcast. so in any case yeah I, I came on board at, at Scribe when he handed off the reins as CEO I was like I love you Tucker I can't work with you if you're the CEO of this company like you know um, and so once he got out of that role, uh, like I came on board and, uh, yeah, he's, he's been a wonderful, wonderful friend, uh, easily. Um, I think the most generous person I've ever met in my life. And, uh, it's funny, I get emails or I've gotten emails or Facebook messages from friends or whatever being like, uh, in, in my wife's friends have been like, why is Charlie friends with Tucker Max Because <laughs> branding on his books? But it's like, well, I got to know him as a, as a person. A person and, yeah. uh, you know, it's like he's more than, you know, poop jokes and hooking up stories. Like he's a, he's a fully realized person. And so, yeah, those books are also yeah. like 20 years ago. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> that helps as well. More than that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, Okay, so the Tucker thing came after you you working with Ramit. Okay, it seems like mm -hmm. with Ramit you worked together, or probably during, right? With Ramit you worked together for like two years, it seems like, or a year and a half. Uh, Ramit, we worked, we did a bunch of stuff. It was like, um, first it was a bunch of video stuff, and then I would come to uh, help. He he asked if he could kind of come up with a, a marketing plan for his book. And we came together and had a lot of similar ideas and uh, combined our best ideas. And then he was like, you know, can you help me market this thing? And, and so I did. And, um, you know, as I, as I said, like the book crushed, like that day it hit number one overall, which is not an easy feat when, what, 500,000 books per year get published now. Um, and so we, we did super well. I, re I remember uh, we we went we flew out to meet up with Gary Vaynerchuk in in New York and just like meet with him and kind of guide him through because his book his first book was coming out Crush It wow. and we just kind of shared what worked for us for it, yeah. like 20 minutes and then the next three hours Gary shared with us what he was gonna do <laughs> and at the time. At the Last time, week. I was like, what the hell is this? Like, do, do we need to be here for this? Like, <laughs> I feel like he's he's got this. Um, little little did I know uh, that he was going to go on to, you know, be who he is today. Or I guess I did know. I should yeah. have known. That's funny. So um, what I guess what did Ramit see in you at the time that made him want to bring you on to help with, with the book, right? Because it, it doesn't seem like you had like a massive... Uh, massive experience in like the book publishing industry either, right? No, I mean, I, I knew marketing principles, uh -huh. really. I knew a lot. Um, and, and a lot of it, like, 
I think marketing ultimately comes down to like, can you make something that delights you, that gets you excited? And if so, like, go find the people who are like you, uh-huh. and they'll get excited too, and they'll want it too. And it's, it, I think everything else kind of over over complicates it. Um, maybe, maybe not. But uh, so with Ramit, the things that I remember him telling me that stood out were like, I proposed things to him that would be of value. And then I just did them. And I would be like, you know, what what would you suggest uh, that we change here or whatever? Like, uh, and the, so like, I could conceptualize something, I could uh, come to him, not just with a proposal, but like a near completed project uh, that was good. And, um, you know, I could be trusted to like, you know, get things, get results. And, you know, the, it reminds me of like the story of Th- Thomas Jefferson, who, you know, when he wanted to get stuff passed by other senators or whatever, he would create the plan. He would come up with the entire plan himself when they would, they would be like, we're going to meet tomorrow and we're going to have a plan. We're going to create the plan together. He would just create the plan. And then he would give them the illusion of control by being like, should we do this or this on this part? And they'd be like, oh, we should definitely do this. And then he would get them fighting over the thing that like he still had total control of. And so I kind of operate in a similar way where it's like, I'm, if I, if I know, if I know like this is a good idea, if I know it's going to help us, if, if I know there's not going to be any pushback, I'm usually just going to do it or like get it to a a minimum viable stage that you know i'll I'll get the green light and and continue forward with it so it's assertiveness proactiveness and like um i know attention to detail mattered to him too where he would he would like tell me something was good enough and i'd be like ah but is it and i'd make it even better yeah nice cool yeah it seems like basically solving solving problems for him right Um, Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, this is another thing, Jeremy. And like, this is not something I would have said even a couple of years ago because it's not something I would say about myself, but I've gotten this feedback enough times that I'm like, okay, this is true. And it's something I didn't account for. I'm fun to work with. Uh Like I'm a nice person. (laughs) I'm normal. I'm not going to bring you down. I'm not going to like, I'm not a negative energy force. You know, I'm not going to hoist my bullshit on you. I'm not going to ask a lot of you i'm a giver and so that could that can also hurt me too um giving too much and not you know asking or receiving but like in general people say they really enjoy wor- the process of working with me beyond the results it's like the journey together is is enjoyable that's a great point so I think actually. That a lot. yeah like I think it probably like how you make the person who you work with feel like probably has a huge impact on like whether they want to keep working with you. (laughs) It's like surprise. Might be the biggest thing. Like honestly, uh, you know, it's it matters to do great work and to get results. But like, I mean, I know that Noah keeps you around because he's like, oh, I just like Jeremy. Even though Jeremy, you know, gets awesome results and stuff, like he wouldn't work with you if you were just like a drag like you know i mean going back to like interviewing people today there there are people who are skilled who i talk to them and i'm like and i just as i'm thinking about should we hire this person i'm like i just didn't like enjoy that interaction yeah you know it it wasn't like it wasn't it didn't feel good to talk to that person and so that's a that's a huge thing yeah huge thing and that can be coached, but it's like if you if you don't have awareness of that, um, you you got to get it fixed. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Any before we get into Tim stuff, um, any big lessons you learned from working with uh, Ramit? It's less uh, like work lessons that I learn from these guys, uh, and in more like character traits that I admire that I'm like, that, that I tend to apply to my life. Um, 
you know, Ramit was was really the one who kind of guided me on, hey, if you want to reach out to Tim, like do it like this. Uh, he even gave me guidance on, I told him, I was like, oh, Seth Godin is going to post our blog post or, or, or I'm sorry, our, our uh, visual resumes to his blog. And I ran some ideas by him and he's like, do this, this and this. And you'll and like, you know, I got feedback on mine that mine was like uh, the uh, it was it's just stood apart. Um, uh -huh. But like the thing that I've really admired about Ramit is like he continues to level up in the ways that he really matters. Like he is the definition to me of both a growth mindset and also like, um, you know, he has this relentlessly long-term vision, right? You think about it, it is not easy to talk about uh, money yeah. for yeah. Uh, close to, gosh, 15 years, wow. right? Yeah. Maybe longer. Yeah. And he's been saying the same message. He's been beating the drum, boom, 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 same stuff. Um, but he finds new ways to say it, right? And and I'm sure he would take offense, right? He's like, Charlie, I've created new products and all this stuff. <laughs> I've created my, and he's right. And and I don't take anything away from that. But like, if you look at the quality of his work, it has progressed, and like he has grown into the CEO he wants to be of his company. And like, um, I would argue he he puts out some of the best online courses in the world yeah. and did like he was he was maybe at the forefront for a while like the best um and like yeah so uh he he has really been systematic about building building the life that he wants and i'd say all of these guys share that trait of like they're creating their magical world that they want to operate in and be the the son of and they attract planets that want to be a part of that world. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's great. I remember during the pandemic, he started, he started uh, going heavy on Instagram and I was just like starting when he, like even like me being in that industry and like, I, I feel like I consider myself like pretty good at that. I was like just studying his storytelling and the way he was using this new platform to, and like leveraging his existing like story selling, storytelling skills, I was like, very impressive. Um, it's kind of cool how he's like leveraging a new platform to kind of talk about what he's already been talking about in a different form. It's like, it's very impressive. 100% agree. I had the same reaction where I was like, wow, this is really fascinating how he's using this as a storytelling device. It's great. Yeah. Okay. So, um, then, uh, you, you mentioned that earlier, basically Ramit, uh, helped you craft an email to Tim. Um, where you kind of leveraged all of these um, stages that you mentioned earlier um, to kind of land a job. One question I was wondering before you mentioned that you had this idea that like this was kind of your dream gig. Had you thought of this? Like, is this like something like you had thought of earlier or did that come later? Like, did you know you wanted to work with Tim before working with Ramit Tucker and all that? Yeah, I did. Um, I, I had a uh, that was like the main driving clear goal, the vision of like, if I can hit that sweet, if I don't like I will land amongst the stars, uh -huh. so to speak. And so that was all um, a master plan. Interesting. I love that. Right. I did. And uh, I mean, you know, you can get into all that law of affirmation, law of momentum, whatever stuff. Uh, and I think there is actually some truth to it. I was not practicing that intentionally or yeah. didn't even know what it was back then, but it's like, um, I had a clear goal and I truly viewed every single thing that happened to me, including setbacks as it was in service of me accomplishing that goal. Yeah. And so it, it, in my mind, it had already been done. It had already been like achieved. And uh, it was like, to me, it was just a matter of time. And so um, in communicating with Tim and with those other people, it was like, yeah, you know, like all of this is in preparation for that when I achieve that. Was Ramit, I'm curious, well, how did Ramit feel when, because uh, you were probably like, a, you were a great hire for him, right? How did he feel about, you asking him to introduce you to like someone else who is going to poach you, you know, <laughs> I was, I was curious oh, about he that. didn't, he didn't poach. Like, you know, I helped Ramit so much in his, yeah. uh, you know, with his book and, and with stuff. Um, but it wasn't like the final stop, so to speak. Okay. Uh, 
that it was more just like, hey, let's work together on stuff and uh, let's let's see if we can we can uh, get you to where you want to go. Uh, but I, I had told him at the beginning, like, I intend to uh, work with Tim and I'm curious, like, what is there anything I could do that would make this like a no brainer uh -huh. introduction for you that you would be proud to give? Um, and so it was like once I knew those terms, it's like, OK, great. That's that's cool. Well, yeah. Okay, so you guys were very upfront about it from the beginning. Yeah. Um, I was not trying to be sneaky about it. I was not like, yeah, I'm gonna get in with Ramit and then Tucker. <laughs> and then I'm gonna get... I was I was very clear and upfront with both of them. Like my my aim is to work with Tim. Yeah. And um, I knew that both of them knew him, and I'm, I was yeah I was very upfront about it. Nice. Okay, so I have the um, I have the email here. I don't know if you can see on your end. I have the cold email that you sent, or not the cold, but yeah. the, the intro email that you sent to Tim. Uh, I'm gonna link in the show notes. I'm not, I don't wanna read through everything because we're a little short on time, but just wanna show basically you really applied, uh, uh, um, I mean, your own concepts here where it's like, you basically reached out uh, with like three propositions of like, here are things I noticed um, that, that can be improved and here's how I can improve it, right? So here you, you suggest like a, some kind of, keep in mind this is what, uh, 2011 or something like that? Uh, this was 2009. 2009. Or two, it might have been 2008, but I think it's 2009. So you're, you're advocating some kind of social network for his, uh, for his followers. Like a community. A community, uh, here's what it would take, here's how I can help and here's how it's gonna benefit you. And then, um, and I, I, you can see it if you're seeing the video, but like I explicitly say in bold what it would take, colon, then explanation, how I could help, yep. and how it will, be, and what the benefits are to you, right? Like I very explicitly laid out everything, yeah, in my thought process. It's very well uh, packaged. Uh, and then you do this with like two other things, um, or one other thing, I guess. Um, and what, what I was surprised, what I wanted to ask you about is like, um, basically you pitch a virtual internship, right? Uh, and I think mm -hmm. you mentioned, uh, he, like Tim asks you like, oh, like what, what do you see this looking like? Uh, and you're like, it's non, non-paid, uh, five hours a week, virtual internship. So I was curious, um, why, why, why only five hours up front? Is that, did that feel like a, um, like a, a lower commitment for him to agree to? Uh, is that, was that kind of the trick or, cause cause where I wasn't yeah. like, oh, that I can like however many hours you need, you know, uh, like 20 hours, 40 hours a week, you know? Yeah, it, to me it was like, how can I, from his standpoint, how can I make this as low risk uh -huh. and low lift as possible? And so it was like, I know I'm probably not, I'm probably gonna work five, more than five hours on on his stuff but um i really wanted to make it seem like this is totally palatable as a trial period really it was like if i can get him to commit to the trial period i've won uh -huh. nice cool and uh and then he said yes um how, how are the first like what were, what were the first couple of weeks like um working with him it's hard to remember, honestly. You know, I was still in my parents' basement working on a computer on our ping pong table. You know, <laughs> so it's like I was doing research there or doing like little things that needed to be done. Um, I can't honestly remember the tasks, but I was actually he at a certain point he was like, "All right, I insist on paying you. I will pay you twenty five dollars an hour." I was like, "Cool," but yeah, I I truly don't recall yeah <laughs> i don't remember what the initial things were they were they were relatively menial assignments but like I'll, I'll give you an example one that i can recall is like hey i just did a contest over um a hundred people signed up or or like did entries can you please pick your top five oh. and why you know so it's it's like stuff like that that is like just time savers got it cool and how did that, how did that evolve um, to you working, um, it seems like pretty intricately on the four hour body? Well, I had endorsements by then. He flew me out to um, 
to San Francisco to hang out with them for a weekend uh, and give me, you know, like give me and him ample time to like experience each other. And do we enjoy, you know, interacting with each other? And and then he mentioned that uh, he was working on his next book, The Four Hour Body. Might I be interested in helping him in various capacities with that? So like uh, maybe doing research or maybe making some uh, doing some reviews or whatever. Um, but he said he would need help compiling the book. Uh, I didn't write the book. I wasn't like a co-author, but like um, just assembling it was going to be a task, right? And so I said I was absolutely interested and um, would love to and was just like, yeah, let's let's do it. And so uh, we did it and he offered me a full-time role. Um, so before that, you were still hourly, like five hours a week or... I don't know if it was five hours. It, was, it might have been more. It might have been less. I can't remember. But like we'd done enough of a trial period that yeah. he he um, he was impressed enough. I would say. I wouldn't say probably impressed, but you know, was, uh, you could you could uh, execute. I could hold my own at at some level. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And how? Uh, I guess you have like a, this trip with him. Were you guys in person then, or was that still uh, remote? Do you, do you move to San Francisco or? It was, it was remote. I just went out there for the weekend and hung out and it was really cool. Uh, it was really, really amazing experience. Um, but we, I didn't move out there until like, I think 2010, I want to say. It might've been, no, yeah, like 2010. Nice. Uh, I was that, digging through some archives, uh, some of the old posts. Um, and one, one of them, um, he mentions that he asked you kind of, it was like, want to be very clear on like what, what you wanted to get out of the engagement, right? Like what was your like 12, 12 month goal, right? Um, what, what was your answer to that? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Okay, cool. I don't remember. Yeah. How, how long was the period of like working on the book together? Um, I can't remember how long the book took, but you know, my responsibilities expanded when I moved out there, everything from like picking up mail to, uh, you know, like Tim and I would regularly post up at a restaurant and both of us be working on stuff related to the blog, uh, or he'd be writing. And, um, you know, we just did a ton of different things around his business and his brand. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't remember exactly how long that period was. I think we worked together for a total of between two and a half and three years. Okay, cool. What what were the most exciting projects for you that stand out? Oh, definitely. The four hour body and uh, opening the kimono were two standouts. You know, I, I felt uh, like I almost, <laughs> I almost killed myself in both of those, uh, but anything great is uh that's worth doing is is usually not without uh, a lot of effort right and so um yeah i'm i'm proud to have done what i did with the four hour body and i think even though opening the kimono i kind of broke myself with that uh was an event that showed me what i was capable of and really solidified me as for myself, my my confidence in being able to pull off difficult things. For for those that aren't familiar, what 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 did that entail? Like, what was your role uh, from ATC oh, with with that event? Yeah, so I was put in charge of planning the event, um, and so like not every single detail, of course, but like ensuring that the one hundred plus people who'd paid ten thousand uh, dollars to come to this thing were going to have an incredible experience uh, from start to finish that everyone was in the loop on every single detail all the speakers were in the loop every you know gift and delightful surprise and, and every single detail was like top-notch I knew nothing about conference I'd never even been to a conference before at that age and uh, so like that helped me in a lot of ways because I was like 
we got to get the best for everything, you know? And so people would comment like, this is the best food I've ever had at a conference. Like, great job with <laughs> like this amazing wine and, and all this stuff. And so that was really helpful. But yeah, it was like me and this other woman who was, who was a professional event planner. She was great. She was just assisting me with like the stuff that I might miss. And <laughs> James Altucher, when I talked to him about this, he was like, wait, so is there a reason you didn't just like, hire the hotel to like organize all the event details. And I was like, James, I didn't even know you could do that. <laughs> like, <laughs> I didn't know I was put in charge of this thing. So I thought I had to figure out every single detail. And so, you know, when things went wrong, which something went wrong on the first night, like I was able to, you know, grace gracefully, like figure it out, make everybody happy. Um, you know, I just like, I didn't panic. Um, Tim had done a really like masterful job of escalating my responsibilities up to before that point. Uh -huh. So like he, he kept stretching me. He was really a great teacher in that regard is like helping me grow into this person that I'd said I wanted to be. Um, but yeah, unfortunately I did, uh, break myself in that process. So what <laughs> after, after, what do you mean by that for, for people that are unfamiliar <laughs> with the story? I took uh, the highest level of nootropics that you can take, a uh, brain drug uh, called modafinil for four days in a row. It's prescribed to people with narcolepsy and military fighter pilots to keep them awake on multi-day missions. And uh, I slept a total of six hours over the course of four days. Uh. And uh, people gave me a standing ovation at the end. They were like, this guy's freaking amazing. <laughs> like, people, people I, I heard the phrase like, where can I get a Charlie? Like probably 10 times. And, um, so it was, it was like weirdly validating, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of disorienting, but I had done that in secret, you know, like, um, I just, I was like paranoid that things would fall apart if I wasn't like totally on top of stuff and sleep seemed to be the thing that would get in my way. Good short-term decision, terrible long-term decision, but that's, that's a story for another day, Jeremy. Uh -huh. uh, that's all in my other book, Play It Away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely recommend that. And I have to go through that at some point. Uh, so uh, that, it seems like that kind of ended your, kind of like your work with, with Tim. And then you kind of had almost like a second act to your career, right? Um, yeah, yeah, I had, to, I had to quit at some point because I was just mentally just in a bad spot. Yeah. It seems like that, I guess you solving that problem for yourself of like, Hey, like, how do I, like, how do I make work more sustainable led to your, your next book, right? It was more, I had to write the book because it was answers that I was desperately searching for at the time. Healthcare professionals were of no use. Uh, other books were of no use and I tried everything to get myself out of this state of crippling anxiety and burnout and nothing was working. And then when I infused play back into my life, like I was symptom free within a month and I went over a year with dealing with that and it was just hell. And so I wrote the, I wrote a post about it that went viral. It, it became the number one search result on Google if you search for anxiety cure. And uh, I just got a flood of people. You know, this was 2014. So no, it was 2012. So no one in the United States was talking about anxiety and mental illness and all this stuff back then, really. Now it's kind of pervasive because everybody's dealt with it. But um, at the time, it was like pretty, pretty eye opening for a lot of people. And uh, that, that book, uh, really was the book I needed to read, uh, that I had wished existed. And so that's who I wrote it for was, was myself. And since then I've heard from CEOs, uh, from people from all walks of life, uh, saying they've, they've read that book five times, 10 times. I've heard people say they've literally read it 10 times because it, gave them hope. It was like the thing they needed. And it's a short book. So it's not like this 400 page thing, but it's, you can read it in an hour and a half if you're a quick reader. And so 
I'm most proud of that book, I think. Mm. What were the biggest lessons you learned uh, from Tim? <laughs> uh, from Tim? Oh, so um, Tim was one of the most uh, influential and important people in my life because he he showed me what's possible. He gave me the room and the space and the opportunities to show me what I was capable of and that I could play with people like him. You know, I, I, I thought I knew it and then I got to experience it. And so it's kind of a selfish answer in that regard, you know, of like, it gave me the opportunity to show myself what I was capable of and he allowed me to play on that field. Um, there's so many lessons. Ryan Holiday actually wrote an amazing post on all the things he learned from Tim because he's worked with Tim in, in various ways over the years. That would be the post I would direct people to. Um, but I got to sit down and write my own post one of these days on everything I learned because I learned a lot. I love it. Yeah, and that, that's what the best teachers do, right? They, they show you what, yeah. what you're capable of. Awesome. Well, th thanks, Charlie. Thanks for your time. I recommend everyone to go check out um, the Recession Proof Graduate. And it seems like, uh, uh, what, what is the course called that you put together? Land a Job You Love. Land a Job You Love, which I have to go check out personally. But it seems like it's the updated version of the book, right? In a, in a more yeah. internet friendly uh, packaging. Showing you what to do, yeah. Exactly. Cool. Uh, appreciate your time. Um, thank you. Absolutely. It's great chatting with you, Jeremy. Thanks, brother. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that episode. And if you did, make sure to subscribe to the channel. And if you want more episodes, I've got some here, 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 or here. All right. Have a great week.